Hi everyone, Michael Britt here. Now, I'm very proud that the Psych Files podcast has been so successful. It passed the 20 million download mark. And a lot of that success is due to my episodes on how you can use proven memory strategies to remember just about anything, from memorizing terms for a test to remembering people's names at a party or a meeting. So, I put all of these episodes into one audio course. Hippos, aliens, and llamas quickly master the tricks to a great memory. And it's available now on avid.fm slash memorymaster. All one word. Hi everybody, Michael Britt here from The Psych Files. This is episode 223, in which it looks like it is time to rewrite the textbooks. We're going to return to uh, one of the most famous stories, and that is a key term here, stories, in the history of psychology, and that has to do with Little Albert. So if you took any psychology, you learned about Little Albert. So he was the, but just in case you didn't, so he was this baby that back in 1919 into the beginning of 1920, one of the very first uh, behaviorists, John Watson, and his assistant, Rosalind Rayner, did some studies on a small child that they referred to as Albert B, or Little Albert. But anyway, uh, this was the, the study in which a, a loud noise, typically a uh, loud uh, banging on a, on a bar, was presented behind Albert when he was given small furry objects, and other objects were, were given to him. This study is in every psychology textbook. It, it comes in because it's it's an early demonstration of what behaviorists uh, will uh, argue, a great degree of credibility, that not all of our emotional problems are necessarily due to underlying issues. They could be due to the association of, of a negative thing with a neutral thing. I wanted to focus, though, on in this episode, on the identity of this little baby. This would guess be the third episode on the Little Albert topic. The first one I did way, uh, quite a while back, so I want uh, in which I reviewed the research of Ben Harris, in which you know he points out that not everything is as as nice a package as we'd like to think. That Watson was really the victim of what all of us are the victims of, which is confirmation bias. That uh, he he paints a picture of the research uh, going so well, when in fact it really wasn't what we think it is. The effect was not that powerful, may not have happened at all in some cases. It persists because of a number of things. One is because a baby is, was involved. Now, now, children are involved in psychological research all the time, although today we have ways to uh, protect them and, and make sure that their parents understand what's involved. So this is one of the one of the first, that there was a video. It probably, if there was no video, this whole thing would not nearly be as big, as popular a topic in psychology as it is. So he did film these events, and you can find them quite easily on YouTube. Ben Harris points out that there's a there's a, a lot about this study that's that's glossed over when it is discussed in introductory textbooks. And there's other reasons why this this uh, Little Albert study is so popular, because I put the, the episode that I recorded, video episode, in 2009, in which I reviewed the research by uh, Beck et al., there's a few other authors there, in which he claims to have discovered the identity of this baby. Watson reports simply that he was adopted by a family from out of town, uh, taken rather suddenly from Johns Hopkins, where he was doing the research, and nothing more is reported about him. So obviously people are curious about what became of this child. And many people are curious as to whether he was psychologically damaged by what happened to him. And just in case you're curious and you don't wait to, want to wait to the end of the episode, there's there's no evidence to suggest that uh, the there was any permanent psychological damage here, even that the the effects that we saw were, were very, very temporary. Question is, who was this child? In order to determine that, let's take a look at what we know for sure, or pretty sure. Uh, we have dates. In other words, Watson and Rayner in their 1920 published article gave us the dates of the filming for of uh, Little Albert, the initial filming. And that occurred between November 28th and uh, December 12th of 1919. And they stated that he was eight months and 26 days old. 
So that would mean if we go backwards eight months and 26 days, and we've got these these two weeks of time. So we're pretty darn sure that this child called Albert B. was born between March 2nd and March 16th of 1919. Okay, so we've got a good approximate birth date. So our next question is, all right, well, what else do we know? Well, we knew from Watson's, again, from his records, that the mother of the baby worked at Johns Hopkins and that she was referred to as a wet nurse at that time. And then we, what do we do? We go look at some census data and we say, all right, and we also look at some data from uh, Johns Hopkins and we say, what, what have we got? What mother... Uh, you know, had a baby during those that period of time. She worked at Johns Hopkins, employed as a wet nurse, and that that gives us three women who who are possible mothers uh, for uh, little Albert, and that would be Arvilla Merritt, Pearl Barger, Ethel Carter. Three women. Now, Ethel Carter was eliminated because she was African American, and so uh, we know from the video that little Albert wasn't. So that left, that leaves us with two women, Arvilla Merritt and Pearl Barger. Now, this is research that was explained in the Beck article of 2009. And he says, all right, well, they did some research because you got Pearl Barger right now. If she had a baby, we have the last name of B, Albert B. Uh, sounds like a good direction to go in. Well, he, he says he went in that direction, but found no evidence that Pearl Barger had a baby during this time. So... He went in the direction of Arvilla Merritt, who did have a baby, and the baby's name was Douglas Merritt. Now, that doesn't quite fit with an Albert. Well, why call Douglas Merritt Albert B? And so Beck's article goes down a number of routes to suggest that, well, okay, why do that? Let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the things, that they, the, some of the facts that we have. Couldn't this baby be Albert B? And so they looked at uh, the images we happened to find in the in the in a trunk in the attic of one of Arvilla Merritt's relatives, which had a, a picture of Douglas Merritt. So they compared the picture of Douglas Merritt with Albert B, and they they go back and forth. It really wasn't terribly convincing, but there was nothing to say. Well, you know, he he could be little Albert. They didn't eliminate him from consideration, although the recent research by Nancy Digdon, a D-I-G-D-O-N, Russell Powell, and Ben Harris. So they, they look at it again. We're going to get to what they saw in just a second. But Beck et, uh, et al. says that he could be. You know, there's nothing. It's not like Douglas Merritt had a scar or something, and little Albert obviously doesn't. So he could be the, uh, this baby based upon looks. Although the interesting thing we know about Douglas Merritt is that he had a condition called hydrocephalus, which I hope I pronounced it hydrocephalus, that sounds right, which is a excess fluid uh, in the brain, and that he eventually died of that disorder several years later. As far as the uh, why would Douglas be called uh, Albert B., they did a little searching and said, well, you know, Watson's name was John Broadus Watson, who was named after a, uh, a preacher named Albert Broadus. Watson named his children William and James after the famous psychologist William James. So, so couldn't he have just been, it's interesting, couldn't he have been doing a little playing around with names here and call him Albert B because of who John Watson himself was named after? Okay, so we have this, this picture going of the reasons why they think that Douglas Merritt was Albert B. Now we have, from the Digden Powell Harris research, some pretty convincing evidence that that was wrong. What is that evidence? Well, let's go back to the beginning. Beck says, well, there's no evidence that Pearl Barger had a baby during this time. Well, the new researchers did some additional searching, and they found that, well, actually there is. So they did some searching on the internet, and they found a genealogical document other documentation, and guess what? Pearl Barger was married in 1921. That's about two years after little Albert's birth. She was married to Charles Martinek, and they had a baby, and would you believe that baby's name was William Albert Barger, born exactly during the time when Albert B. would be born. They found out, again from relatives, that he was referred to by his middle name of Albert. 
Okay, that maybe that doesn't prove, it's good evidence, that William Albert Barger was little Albert. And unfortunately, William Albert Barger died in 2007. So he lived a long time, but we just missed him. So he's not around for us to, to talk to about this. But let's re-examine, and that's really what uh, Digden, Powell, and Harris did. They re-examined Beck's evidence, and then they re-examined what we did know. We do have some records of William Albert Barger, medical records from Johns Hopkins. So, so here's what, let's take a look at all of this. And I, th I think we'll find that the evidence for William Albert Barger is, is far stronger than for Douglas Merritt. What do we know? From looking at the video, we know that little Albert did not have a cleft chin. William Merritt definitely does have a cleft chin. Uh, that is something that is not really mentioned in the Beck research. And so again, what, 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 what the three new researchers say is that, you know, they, once the previous team had decided that Merritt was the baby, they, they give evidence in favor of it, but not evidence against it. And that, you know, that's confirmation bias. We don't pay attention to things that don't confirm what we already believe. So here's, this is this business of the, of the cleft chin. That's, that's an important piece. Uh, let's take a look at the eyes. If you look at Al little Albert's eyes, they're pretty small and pretty far apart. Uh, Douglas Merritt's eyes are quite large and uh, closer together. And why is that? Well, that's because Douglas Merritt had this uh, hydrocephalus, the fluid in the brain that gave him what's referred to, people who suffer from this have, as uh, the new researchers point out, uh, what's called sunset eyes. Okay, they're, they're large and uh, it's a pretty distinctive feature. That, in addition to the cleft chin, mm, that's pretty uh, that, that's pretty damning evidence for the Douglas Merritt uh, interpretation. More evidence, earlobes. Well, we see in Little Albert, we see in the video in 1919 that Little Albert has attached earlobes. One thing we do know is that as an adult, Albert Barger had attached earlobes. Now, this is the, we don't have the, the picture of Douglas Merritt as a baby. He's got a bonnet on. We can't really tell. So that may not be the strongest bit of evidence, but we've got much stronger ones. Little Albert's head. We can estimate his the circumference of his head by looking at the video. Believe it or not, this is how this is how it's very interesting how much the researchers have gotten into this video. We can estimate the circumference of his head by comparing it to other objects in the video, the size of which we know. All right, and the estimate is that at nine months, little Albert's head circumference was 46.1 centimeters, which is about, which is a little large, 80 percent, and puts him on the 80th percentile, 46.1 centimeters. Well, if we look at Douglas Merritt, 12 days prior to the um, to Watson's filming, Douglas's head is is. 46.5 centimeters, large enough to put him in the 90th percentile. That's probably because of the hydrocephalus. And nine days after this filming, we've got a, a size we can, uh, we have, because of the pictures uh, of Douglas Merritt, his head circumference is now 48 centimeters, which puts him in the 99th percentile, right? So just a little bit after the filming, Douglas Merritt's head circumference is 48 centimeters and Little Albert's is 46. So th this that just doesn't seem to work there as far as the case for Douglas Merritt. Body weight. Well, we know that right around, and Watson's records aren't really, really good, but we, uh, but we do have a record that indicates that, at, again, at nine months, the baby in the study is 21 pounds, okay? The information we have about uh, Douglas Merritt is that right around that time, just prior to that, Douglas Merritt is 14 pounds and 15 ounces. So he's about 16 pounds. That puts him about five pounds lighter than the little baby in the study. Uh, whereas we do have, this is one place where we do have some data about William Albert Barger, and he is 21 pounds, 15 ounces. So much closer in body weight to the baby in the picture. This is pretty convincing evidence that, that really, and it's simpler evidence, the, although there is a little bit more, and I think another issue that the recent researchers took, the research by Beck and Fridland, is that they suggest that, that Watson knew 
that this baby they were they were studying had this condition that he was neurologically impaired, which you know adds another ethical you know concern that Watson chose this child maybe because a baby who had some neurological problems he was you know he, he could use such a child in his study, whereas a healthy baby um, may not be. But Watson refers to the baby as healthy. So why would he uh, use a baby that was neurologically impaired, as Beck and Fridland, etc., uh, suggest? Well, it, it doesn't make any sense. It, it just that it doesn't fly. Because here's the information that we have. We know from what again from watching the videos that little Albert was crawling, and he was crawling at eight months and twenty six days. But we have data that su suggests that because of Douglas Merritt's neurological condition, he never learned to, certainly not to walk. Mobility-wise, Douglas Merritt was significantly impaired, whereas William Albert Barger did not have that, and that we have evidence that he was, in fact, uh, crawling around the crib. And the other thing is that Douglas Merritt was reported by doctors to be nearly or possibly entirely blind, again, because of his condition. You just have to watch the video to see that little Albert is not at all visually impaired. He's watching everything that's going on in front of him. So not that there aren't a few inconsistencies. Watson says that the baby was taken rather suddenly and adopted by a family from out of town. Well, that's not true for Douglas Mayer, and it's not true for William Albert Barger. So we're not quite sure where that piece of information comes from. But when you look at all of the data here, and I know this, this is this is this is a lot, right? This is quite a dig in, into the past. It is interesting if you're into history, and I know your history teachers told you that history is a lie. Well, you know, here's I think a pretty good example that, you know, we're still learning what happened 95 years ago, and I think we've learned that the baby's true identity. And I just want to quote Ben Harris. Uh, you know, he I think he put this quite uh, cogently. In an email, as I, I did email, I've emailed and, and had good back and forth with both of these authors. And so, uh, you know, they're both trying to, to get a good grasp on who this baby was. Quote from Ben Harris on this most recent research. What is most important are the medical records for, um, for all of these children. And they rule out Douglas Merritt. Okay. And I think he's, he's correct there. Further quote. This dispute between these, between his about the identity of the baby, has been settled to the satisfaction of all neutral observers, from journal editors to manuscript reviewers to textbook authors who have read the research. The argument is settled, and I would turn to the question of why it took the field of psychology five plus years to get this sorted out. And I think that's a good question, and I, and I guess I would pose before closing this episode. I think I think the reason is that we were all taken in. We and I've done episodes on how stories really pull us in, and you, you may know that from from other experiences. You hey, if you read a good novel, the the Douglas Merritt story is is got all twists and turns and mystery and discovery, and and it just seems you know right there. But more often than not, the truth is simpler and less dramatic.